Welcome back to the 615 Sessions podcast. We got a couple of first timers, Chris Harris at Channel 4 and Jill Jelnick of Fox 17 hanging out here with us. I don't know why I, I assume I'm a, I mean, most people assume I'm a jerk anyway. I think Chris would probably speak to that narrative, but I don't know why it is the first time that either of you have been on the podcast. So this is an incredible um, misstep by me, but I'm grateful for both of your presence. Thanks, man. Sounds like poor planning that finally got rectified. I know, right? We're Chris and I are just so busy. You know, it's it's okay. We we were able to squeeze you in today, Buck. So happy to do that. Listen, I uh, as somebody, uh, our schedules are going to get a lot busier. So I am completely respectful of any time that everybody else doesn't want to spend in front of cameras or microphones before we have to. What we do is great, and football season is fun. But like it's summertime and. I, uh, I hate to bother more of my friends for their time for free on a recurring basis. But anyway, we got Titan stuff to talk about. We are less than two weeks away at the time of this podcast recording from Titans training camp. There are top 10 lists all over the place because it's July and sports media has nothing better to do. But I think in kind of looking at what we've got ahead of us, Chris, there's so many different storylines around the Titans that are compelling this year. Most of them seem to be on offense, but you know, for as, as dull as summertime can be in football, we've had a lot of really compelling stories come out of this, uh, these last couple of weeks of the off season. Uh, we have, and uh, can I just say the very, the only thing right now, right out of the gate that I hope happens on day one of the training camp is that Traylon Burks is there because God <laughs> help us all. If he's not, I'm about done talking with about that stuff about him not being there. And so I just, I want that theme to go away. What do you think? How, how do you guys do that on TV? Because like I got room to work on radio or on podcasts. I can bitch and moan about a, a wide receiver with asthma. All I like in any different uh, number of ways without much limitation, but you guys got like what? Three and a half minutes, five minutes on television at any given point. If not, that's very generous. Five minutes is generous, unless it's the weekend. Then I get I get my whole my own show and we do whatever we want on the weekend. But five minutes is generous. But you're right, but we do not get a lot of time to deep dive into it. We say what we know. And for a while, we didn't even know Traylon Burks had asthma. We didn't know what was going on. We could kind of assume that obviously there was some sort of physical condition because he was in and out of OTAs and rookie camp. But honestly, as much as I think I really had to stick to the basics, especially because the other part of television is we don't, and I, I won't speak for Chris, but I, I can't put my opinion in there. One, I don't have time. Two, I'm a female talking about sports. Right. Um, I, it's the facts. It's what we know. And so for a while it was, hey, we're a little concerned about Traylon Burks. We'll let you know when we know something more. So I think that big day was when uh, wide receivers coach uh, Rob Moore finally uh, dropped the the asthma word, and we're like, okay, well that that clears up something. Wait, which, by the way, bless him for that. Like Let, enough bless of this. him. <laughs> why, like why why do I have to why do I have to play state secrets with Mike Vrabel? And listen, I don't even go to every press conference anymore. You guys are you guys are doing it on a much more regular basis than I am at this point, just because of uh, you know different responsibilities and things like that. But. Um, I, I don't know why it took so long, Jill, for that to just be a part of the story so we could move on or at least have some kind of reasonable discussion around it rather than pure and uh, pure and total speculation for the most part. And like, am I wrong? Am I wrong to not care about Traylon Burks until I have to care tra about Traylon Burks? Like, I just I want to talk about the tight ends. I think that Kyle Phillips is interesting. I think that Robert Woods is fascinating. And all I can get anybody to care about is a wide receiver allegedly with asthma. Right. No, I, I agree. I One, I, tight end has been my favorite position to watch just because of the new faces and how much that's been a need for the Titans in the past. But I, I'm tired of, of talking about Traylon Burks and his asthma too. Like, I, I'm glad that kind of was like the cat that came out of the bag. But to Chris's point, that will be the number one storyline, not just because he's the first round pick, but because the Titans traded away their star wideout, A.J. Brown to move up in the draft to get Traylon Burke. So unfortunately, until he is back on the field, 100%, making some great catches, Traylon Burks is going to be that, that big storyline. And then selfishly, like, you know, from the TV perspective, Buck, like it, it gets down to if he's not there, then how do you show video of a guy who's not there? <laughs> like, then you yes, got to show a great old point. video. Hey, here he was in minicamp, but he's not there now. And so it's not like, you know, we can just put 
you can show a wide shot of all the receivers going through the line. Oh, well, hey, you don't see number 16 out there. Oh, well. And then a sound value about why he's not there. You, you so, mean yeah, to tell so, me that Selfishly, it... from our standpoint, I just want him there. Here's the video. Here's the sound of him talking. That's day one. We're moving on. I don't think that's selfish at all. In fact, I think you are. I think you are in the uh, majority. I'm sure that many Titans fans within the sound of our voices here today would probably agree with that assessment. Um, now, as far as like the biggest storyline, though, of training camp, I don't necessarily know that it's trailing. I mean, this Jeff Simmons holding thing is, is yes. kind of funky, um, you know, with all that whole I mean, the whole 2019 class has has a track record of success outside of DeAndre Walker because he didn't make it. Out of Georgia, but the I mean, they five starters and six picks. That's quality stuff. Um, now the bill is coming due on all of them. Jeff probably the biggest in more than one way, but they got a lot of considerations to make with a lot of critical players on this roster. And I think Jeff's status before training camp, we're two weeks out yet, a little less than. But to still not know exactly what the situation is going to be for him, Chris, and whether that's going to be resolved by the time everybody reports, um, I think kind of hangs over everything in the meantime. But he's got a plan, Buck. He's part, it's part of the plan. They've, they've got a plan set, and they're executing the plan. Now, how that gets executed remains to be seen. But uh, let's just, again, let's hope the plan works out to where he's not a holdout because then that's another storyline that – we chase every single day, right? Is that the most confusing press conference we have been a part of <laughs> at any point in, in the Mike Vrabel tenure? There have been some head scratchers, but like, God love Jeff. I, I don't know what happened in the middle of the explanations there. It was just word salad. Like I, there was no cohesion to it whatsoever. And, and, but if there were talking about a contract, but we're not talking about a contract. So if we are talking about a contract, maybe they're talking about contract with, the Titans. I don't. I don't. I don't know what the hell that was for thirty minutes of our day. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say this, and Jill, I'm curious to hear what you think too. I was actually impressed by it because, like, up until that point, you know, Big Jeff, like, it's been, you know, smiles, and he's a feel-good guy and a fun guy to be around and all that stuff. He really, he has not been pressed on anything because there's no reason to press him on anything. The only time he's actually been grilled was his opening presser when he first got here yeah. about his past, right? And that was what it was. But this was the first time he had been grilled. And I was actually impressed with how he handled himself with the like, I mean, he was deflecting stuff left and right. And he knew he was only going to say what he was going to say. And no one was going to get him to say anything more than that. So I was actually a little impressed by how he handled himself. That's much right. better. That's much better perspective. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you, Chris. I think that might've been the longest presser that I've ever been a part of. We're at the end of it. I go, okay, so I don't think I learned anything. What, what, did what exactly did I learn? Yeah. So the, to your, to your point, you know, give big Jeff credit. He, he knew he had a plan going into that presser <laughs> and, and he executed that perfectly. My favorite part is, and I don't think a lot of people know this. He really tried to get that presser over with and, and kind of jump the gun. He came out, big Jeff came out to that outside press conference area super early way ahead of, of his time slot when most of the media had been, it was still in the scrums. He asked Robbie twice, at least twice, maybe three times. Hey, can we, can we go? Can we go? I was like, Hey, not yet. We got to get everybody here. Everyone's not here yet. He, it was, I was watching him. He didn't seem stressed. He was like, it was definitely a player that was like, okay, we got to Let's get this thing over with. Um, and then having heard all of that, now it makes sense. Um, but yeah, he has a plan. Um, he did say numerous times. We didn't ask him this. He said at least twice he'll be at training camp. So we'll see him at training right. camp. Well, he, was, he was also at mini camp, too. That doesn't mean he went on the field for it. He was there, though. He was so there. I'm curious to see mm -hmm. if that holds true for training camp. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know about y'all, but all I heard was unavailable. I didn't hear anything other than unavailable, unavailable, unavailable. Anyway, can't wait to get back together with Mike Vrabel and do it every day for the next... <laughs> <laughs> six months now it'll be fun um but with uh with all of that given that at least i mean three starting high level uh, high to above average level starters from that same draft class are also going to be do contracts chris i don't know how you feel about amani hooker or david long or nate davis because all i mean all three have different situations and especially coming out of last season I think the evaluations are kind of skewed 
on everybody coming into 2022. But of, of those three players, who would you prioritize contractually as far as what they mean to the team, right guard, a great safety alongside Kevin Byard, somebody who's clearly got the league's attention um, and grades out, you know, I, I don't know, I don't advance metrics, podcasting or radio tends to lose people's attention, but turns out he grades out really, really well. Amani Hooker does. And then David Long, who has, has been this next gen Jayon Brown type of player. The question is who would I think they would prioritize right now? Who would you prioritize? Yeah, well, I think it depends on th what happens this year, right? Like the biggest question mark out of all those three guys is surrounding Nate Davis, not only because of his play, but because of the guys around him. I mean, there are two jobs on his in his unit that are still technically up for grabs. So depending on how this season goes, I, I think maybe also kind of determines his valuation, right? I no, mean, as, I think that's reasonable. Collective. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's it's tough, tough to say right now. I mean, I would assume – if you ask me right now, then maybe maybe Imani Hooker maybe skews towards the immediate priority, but I, I think it's all going to be based on on what happens this year. I think that's I mean I think that's fair, Jill, especially with the amount of money that they're going to have to figure out figure out around Jeffrey and the salary cap implications even next year of things like Julio Jones and Derrick Henry, the price going up, and what do you do with him if there's a potential fall off? Like there's so many different factors that are going to go into this thing. Yeah, and I agree with Chris. I think because of his position, because of where the Titans are, Nate, Nate Davis has has that kind of question mark, exclamation point urgency. But without the season, if you had to figure, ask me today, get a deal done, who would it be? I, I'd say Monty Hooker, just because that defense shown so well last year. And with him, like you said, alongside Kevin Byard, I think it just he's been the most impressive, um, top priority. Um, I think that's what Chris said. But if but if, again, you take into the season into account, God, anything can happen, right? We learned that last year. Well, it just depends on if you want to get ahead of the price tag, right? Because we're exactly. seeing Minka Fitzpatrick, has got a massive deal. Now he's not going to be, Imani Hooker's not making $18.4 million a year or anything like that. He's not making Kevin Byard money either, which is, I think, ballpark 16 right now with the kind of money that's left on his deal. So it's just a matter of, our, okay, are you going to beat it to market? Or are you going to let it play things out? And you know, depending on how much you value the player or how much more you have yet to see. I don't think any of those, I don't think any of those situations are mutually exclusive from one another from, for uh, lack of a better term. Uh, Chris, what, what do you, you think? think? Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to ask Buck quickly. And what do you think too? Like John Robinson, at least from my perspective has kind of historically been like, let's wait until we have to make the call to make the call. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What do you, what do you think? That was oh, the case AJ Brown, right? And then look what happened. And market value skyrocketed in two months for the wide receivers. Yeah, the but the AJ thing, like I did a whole bit today making fun of that ridiculous Nashville SC uh, fan um, list of demands that they were making of the of the soccer club and just talking about, you know, overplaying your hand, right? Like we talked about, you, Chris, you remember the Preds anthem singer that got all bent out of shape about Carrie Underwood doing the playoffs instead of him? Like Dennis came, Dennis came Morgan. That was a whole thing. Like the Tennessee and wrote articles about it. And so, you know, talking about overplaying your hand, like, I feel like that happened to AJ a little bit. I don't, I don't know what, I mean, AJ got, AJ got the bag, right? AJ got the money. AJ is now valued as a top six financially, whatever wide receiver, I think is, it is, is the range that puts him in. And, and, you know, not that these ESPN top 10 lists matter, but he was excluded from the top 10 list of wide receivers in the NFL, even though he's being paid $100 million at that position. So there, AJ's, I don't know, that was such a wonky one. But to your, to your question, Chris, I think that with John, it's been, all right, if we can get it done before training camp, great, but we'll largely get those things handled before training camp. In the case of something like Jeff, more than Hooker or or right. Davis or Long, like we're talking about. And in reality, all four of those players are not going to come back because that's a lot of money. And you should be able to find a guard in the third round or an inside linebacker in the sixth. Um, but in kind of looking at that, I would say John's, John's really only motivation with stuff like that is get it done before training camp so I don't have to talk about it anymore. Or you don't have to talk about it anymore. Like the dreaded yeah. distraction in football is the thing that, you know, it's like these guys kryptonite. But uh, with, with all that, I think it's going to be pretty interesting to, uh, to see how everything plays out. Jill, who do you think the best running back in football is? Derrick Henry. Even Unequivocally? 
unequivocally. I, I, lo I loved watching Jonathan Taylor just because I, I love watching. I think I, I'm former athlete. I love seeing athletes perform well, even if, you know, Oh, oh my gosh. Excuse me. Is that a pop up? It, it was a pop up. Excuse me. Excuse That's me. outstanding. No, are you I, kidding I know, me? Right? The podcast is way funnier if we screw up. <laughs> um, I think while I enjoyed seeing Jonathan Taylor do so well, and I give him credit, I fantastic season um, was the best running back last year watching. And I have only been in Tennessee for one year, but what Derek Henry did in just eight games with the Titans and starting last season, he was on pace, easily on pace for his fourth thousand plus yard season. I mean, God, it, this guy is incredible size speed. And that was my other favorite part when I was watching ESPN defend trying to um, Lewis Riddick, trying to defend why Jonathan Taylor should be the number one running back. He said, well, Derrick Henry is bigger and faster and stronger. And then he said, but I think Jonathan Taylor, it should be the number one running back because of all X factors. I, I thought that he said exactly why Derrick Henry is the best running back. His, his, phys, his physicality, his size, his speed, all of that together. Um, I think you, you compare, let's hopefully, fingers crossed, Derrick Henry has a great season, healthy I think you will see right away the difference between Jonathan Taylor and Derrick Henry. Um, I, I just, I don't think it's that much of an argument. I get if people wanted to give Jonathan Taylor that number one spot because he was the rush, leading rusher last year and obviously was healthy. But Derrick Henry to me is just the, one of the most phenomenal athletes I've ever covered. I'll end with that. Here's, here's the question that I think should put the entire argument to rest. If Derrick Henry doesn't get hurt last year, are we even having this conversation? No, we're not. Done. That's <laughs> efficiency, <laughs> baby. <laughs> That's television. That's what you do when you've got when five minutes is a lot of time on television. Chris Harris, Channel 4, kind enough to come hang out with us. Jill Jelinek, Fox 17. Uh, you guys know, uh, know who they are. Give them a follow on social media if you don't already. Football season's coming up. There's no better reason to get back into local sports than everything that's happening with both the Titans and balls. Hell, the Preds. I know you guys are at all kinds of press conferences that I don't have to go to outside of what we do on a normal basis around here. But I appreciate your time as always. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks, Buck. Yeah, appreciate it, Buck. Hey, Buck, uh, are we going to talk about the bowling ticket I got to raffle off? Hell yeah. That's exactly what we're going to do. So, Chris Harris. Now, I... I'm, I'm on to you and I'm on to Emily Proud and Don Davenport, everybody who's bought tickets as a cop out to get to not have to go bowling with me. All right. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is. I don't know why none of my friends actually want to come themselves to the bowling event, but it's okay because what, uh, what I've, everybody's done is really, really cool. Coach Mack bought five tickets to give away to some, uh, to some listeners on the radio show the other day. So Chris has offered to purchase a Brooklyn bowl uh, split decision or split happens, I think is the name of this thing. Bowling bash. We're throwing a party for an incredible charity, the Church of Mount Carmel, their free youth summer camp program. It's all donation based and the ticket proceeds go directly to charity. So we're going to raffle one off. I'm going to give you the cue on social media. We're going to tag Chris in it. We're going to tell you how you can win this ticket from or for Brooklyn Bowl, courtesy of Chris Harris. Well, you go, you're going out of town. You're getting, you're getting away before uh, training camp starts or something. Uh, I'd just be working that night. So, I mean, it's a great, great cause. And I'm happy to help donate to it. So yeah, you just, uh, you fire it up there, man. And we'll give one away. Well, I, uh, I feel like a jerk now for shaming you because you have to do your job <laughs> instead of come <laughs> with the rest of us. Cause I'm going, you know, I'm like I said, we're throwing a party. It's for charity, but we're throwing a party. So it's going to be a great time, but I appreciate that very much, Chris. And uh, we will make sure that we get the winner tag that we get you tagged in the tweet and that we get uh, the winner, the ticket to Brooklyn Bowl. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, buddy. Anytime.